because you were you was breaking it down. Okay, hey, we're in class with Dr. Gray Carr. And, hey, uh, Professor Hunter, my dear friend. Hello there, sir. <laughs> and as we always, we, we, we spend like maybe a minute or two before I hit record, and I'm just like, you know, telling you, well, we did this thing last week. Maybe we should talk about this. And, and in the middle of it, though, we are having class. So I'm like, all right, let me just, let me hit record here. Yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you all for joining us. Um, what I was talking to Dr. Carr about before I hit record was that, you know, we, last week we had a conversation about the Husia and Karenga, and we were talking about God. And because when we go live next week, I wanted to have this conversation around the Bible and God and spirituality as it relates to black people. Cause I think so many of us are so wedded to something that we are in bondage and so many of us have rejected it because we know it's the white man, the, 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 the white man's a slave Bible that we are missing freedom. Yes. So there's two yes. things happening in our community where there's a complete and total utter rejection of God. And then there's a, a over embracing of God to the point where many of us are handcuffed in our own lives and don't understand what this relationship is. So I, I don't know, again, we've never really talked about where you sit spiritually or what have you, but I know you know origin. And I know you know Bible before Bible. And so I want to have this conversation as we lead into the live so that people can come prepared with their questions and with their curiosity around it. And we're, we are going to talk about Beyonce because that was promised uh, as well because I still haven't finished it. But um, hey. No, that's okay. I, may, I forced myself to do it. Plus, plus my brother, my blood brother in Nashville is a, is a minister. So he has a little church, Infinity Fellowship. They're doing some incredible stuff. It's non-denominational. It's not just not Christian or Muslim. It's a spiritual thing. So he asked me to have a conversation. Me and him had a conversation last week, uh, a couple of weeks ago about it. And uh, so I forced myself to finish watching it, which meant I had to figure out a way to watch it. Because a lot of the stuff is, you know, a lot of stuff is from Lion King, her, 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 her album and her visual album. So a lot of stuff is in videos on YouTube anyway. But I had to force myself into that Disney space because I just, you know, as, as you so brilliantly guided us into that conversation about Disney and about Mickey Mouse and animation, you know, I always feel some kind of way about giving Disney one penny. So, <laughs> but I did force myself to do it. And we did promise them, so we will. We'll get to it, but but I think in that larger framework that you're laying out, that continues the conversation, like you said, we began last week. Um, this is very powerful because, you know, I too want to know. I don't think any of us can know, and that's why you know. Um, in fact, the, one of the things that, and I think Karinga actually does gloss this in the Husea. I know Carruthers talks about it, and uh, Aikwe Arma, who has retranslated the. Uh, the text of Tao Tep. Tao Tep was a brother from uh, about 2200 BC. So 4,000 so years ago, uh, his tomb is still intact on the Giza Plateau in the shadow of the Great Pyramid. We go there every year. And um, he said one of the things in his text, which was the text they used in schools. So to teach young people how to read and write, they would have them copy the glyphs. But in copying the glyphs, they would be very careful about the type of books they would have these young people copy as they were learning their glyphs. And one that they had was a treatise or a sebaite, they would call it in ancient Egypt, a teaching called the teachings of Ptahhotep. And this was an elder who had reached a very advanced age and he went to the government and, and went to the Pertwa, the great house is uh, the literal translations. We call it the Pharaoh. Pharaoh doesn't mean king. It means literally the great house. In other words, the nation is the house and the great house is responsible for administrating the, na administering the nation. So he goes to the Pertwa. He says, look, I'm old. I can't taste nothing no more. I can't barely see. He said, my bones hurt. He said, may I be uh, allowed to make what he called a um, medu ayu. Medu is like a speech, but it also is the word, one of the words for staff or stick. So he said, may I be allowed to make a speech or a staff of Uawu, which is like old age, a staff of old age, meaning like, like what we used to do. I'm sure, you know, you running, you running errands for your father or your grandmother. My grandmom say, go down there, go down there. They're using us as their legs. That's literally a staff to hold them up. But in doing that, they're also teaching us how to behave. So they're making us a speech. So the Egyptians, the word speech is the thing. They're putting the speech into our lives or our speech. So they're speaking into us and they're using us. That one little word, 
that translates in the uh, consonants is MDW, Medu. So he says, can I make a, a speech of old age? Literally, may I train my replacement? And the government is like, are you kidding? Yes, that's what we want you to do. So the rest of the book is Patahotep saying, here's the way you move through the world. Do not think that you know everything. He said, one of the things he says is, good speech or the highest form of knowledge that you can speak in the world may be found among everyone. He says, go over there. You see those women over there who are pounding grain? Yeah, go over there. They have good speech. In other words, don't go look to the Pharaoh. I don't go to the Pharaoh. Go look, look to me. Go find me. So I went all the way around it to come to this point that you just raised, really. He says, the limits of knowledge are never reached. So yeah, I, I, have, a, I have a gesture in my mind through study and listening of what comes before the Bible, as do you. But we both, we all, and Tao Tep would teach us, we all should want to know realizing that we will never know <laughs> but the but the wanting to know is the thing and if we can get the wanting to know we won't be fooled by people who say well i know someone's man anybody say they know oh okay so you know huh <laughs> okay so i didn't realize <laughs> so let me just listen to you because i want to know so tell me what you know but i don't think you know and and, and you have framed us with spirituality which is the essence of wanting to um, spirituality and left box the rest of it. Yeah. <sighs> My internet is very shaky. Uh, so let me apologize to folk. Uh, so what Dr. Carr, and I'm, I'm not going to, you know, I can't apologize for something, something I can't control. I'm just going to rebuke it in the name of Jesus. And even saying that, rebuke you know, it. Even, I'm going to rebuke that in the name of Jesus. These are yes. things we just do. Right. And, and yes. they make us feel good. I do think that there's some power in it when I say it. But oh, I, don't, I don't know why I say it, other than I believe that there's some power when I say I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. Interesting. Interesting. You know, it's interesting. Uh, uh, a little while ago, I was talking to my dear friend and elder, uh, Baba Jeremiah Wright. I mean, you talk about a genius. This brother is a world-class genius. Shout out to Rock Obama, anyway. <laughs> You know, because see, when, when you do this, when you do something like that to Reverend Wright, you've done nothing to Reverend Wright. You've told on yourself. So at any rate, so I'm listening to Reverend Wright, and we're bringing up this very point. And he, he goes, he, he was talking about, we were talking about the, the nature of what you just put your friend, this question of Jesus, and this question of the power of the word. And he said, you know that old song they sang where you just say, I told Jesus it'd be all right if he changed my name. He said, Think about the power relationship there. Jesus didn't change my name. <laughs> In other words, I told Jesus it would be all right. Meaning what? Who, who has the authority in that relationship to give consent? <laughs> to do? Jesus not going to change my name unless I tell him it's all right. I told him it'd be all right. Now, he can do it if you want to, if you're in that framework. But the idea that our search is always a search for self-definition and even in that moment, we have the authority to, to, to control our speech. And controlling speech is really the thing. In fact, so we, we were talking about it, we back and forth. I was like, Bob, you know, it's always fascinates me how people of African descent are always anchoring what we think we know in a larger framework of what we don't know, but we just believe is out there. And when we try to contain it, so when you said, I'm going to rebuke this in the name of Jesus. People might say, well, I'm a Muslim, or I don't believe in none of that. No, 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 no. Don't, don't get hung up on the name. Understand the process. In other words, this internet is shaky, but there's something beyond the internet, and I am going to forestall that thing by saying, it's going to be all right thing. Intervene on this and stop this. Why? And I'm going to call the name that in this moment, I was, I was trained to use as the power. The name signifies power. You know, it's funny, uh, uh, Professor Hunter, my, my, uh, maybe about 15 years ago, I was in class and we were reading this book called The Mask of Art by Clyde Taylor, who's uh, retired now. He's living, I think, in Belize. He, 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 uh, he uh, was at, on the faculty at New York University for many years. And I mean, a brilliant, oh man, this brother. His book, The Mask of Art, is about breaking this contract with whiteness. I mean, uh, so many jewels he drops in this 
book. You know, he says the power and whiteness lies in its invisibility. You know, you have to say, oh, we have a black Jesus in our church. Why? Because Jesus means white in this framework. You don't even have to say white Jesus. It's just implied. Look, we have the first black president here yeah, because president means white. You don't have to say white president. And uh, I mean, so that's why when ta said our first white president, I'm like, bruh, I get the argument. It's very interesting that you would call Trump that, but you do mean, you know, president means white, bro. That's why you have to say black president. You know, my president was black. My Maybach is too. Yeah, That's not progressive, brother. That's, that's reinforcing the idea that president means white. So anyway, so Taylor's dropping all these jewels and then we get into this conversation, and I used to, when my classes were small enough, I was teaching my Black Aesthetics class, now that class has uh, like 120 students, but this is when, when I, years ago when I could get like 50 in a room, we would go in a big circle. We'd come in the room and immediately turn the thing into a circle. If you can get in a circle, that's the best way. Why? Because none of us have the authority on what we know. So let's get in a circle, <laughs> and we're going to go around and talk, and whoever's talking, that's the authority in the moment. We'll go through. So I remember this young sister, Michelle Watkins from Chicago. I'll never forget Michelle. She ended up working with Jesse Jackson with Operation Push. And she, I mean, a minister. She's, I mean, you know, she loved Jesus. Jesus loved her. <laughs> so we, we in this class talking about the Yoruba, the Akan, all this stuff, aesthetics. We in there and she said, and we started talking about the power of speech. And we're, we're reading Clyde Taylor. We're talking about breaking these paradigms. And she said, that's true right there. I'm going to tell you right now. Anything anybody tell you the black people are not in control, I rebuke them in the name of Jesus. And when she said that, we all got up and started running out the door. Because <laughs> she said it, she called it so powerfully. Like you said, it was something visceral with black people. We was like, whoa, oh. And I was like, oh, everybody. Y'all see what we just did? I said, now nobody planned that. Nobody rehearsed that. Nobody knew it was coming. That is the power. When the Egyptians say medu or speech, that's what they talk about. When the Yoruba people say ashe at the end of an uh, uh, incantation, the, the ashe is the power to make things happen. That's the divine power, the thing we cannot see. When the uh, tree, they will say yao at the end of uh, their pouring libation, and they'll, they'll call the name of a very powerful ancestor. Like you might say, my father, yao, my mother, yao, my great great grandmother. And they'll say yao, like that, they say, yeah, or the word that we use. In the ancient Egyptian, that darkness that's at the beginning of Genesis, that because the Hebrews take it out of the Egyptian. I mean, they were there for several hundred years, if you take their notion. And Moses didn't speak any Egyptian. I mean, Moses didn't speak any Hebrew. He was trained by the Egyptians. So, I mean, let's be clear. So, when he, at the end of a prayer, the people would say, one of the prayers, some of the comedic prayers, they would say, it is our moon, although hidden who is the source of all life, power, and health. Amun is not a person as such. Amun is the idea, it translates literally as the unseen one, the hidden one, Amun. The Muslims would say, Amin, and the Christians would say, Amen. They never, they never considered the origin. It, amen. Yeah, no, it is Amun. It, that's an Egyptian word. It is Amun, the unseen one. In other words, don't be looking for hands. Don't be looking for gender. Don't be looking for a throat and a voice and some eyes. Just know that that thing you cannot see, the thing that you call on to make sure the internet stays stable because the, the threshold to the thing you can't see is the one that you could because Jesus Christ said, I'm here to fulfill the prophecy. I'm, it's a genealogy back to the unseen one. In the beginning was the word. In other words, before the word, darkness covered the, in other words, it is the unseen one, our moon. That's what we call it. It ain't even Jesus. I mean, even the Catholics would say that the origins of European Christianity is Catholicism, of course, and that's all borrowed from the earlier traditions. But when they do the Hail Mary, Holy Mary, Mother of God, I used to say, oh, God got a mother? Oh, it's something before. In other words, they, don't, they say it without even saying it. <laughs> you know what I'm so, so, I mean, it's like, you, you understand, there's always something before. There's always something that begat something. You get the Genesis here. Before they even tell you, okay, we're going to walk you through all these stories. We're going to walk you through all these testaments. We're going to walk you through the eyewitness testimony. And then the whole majority of this is people who ain't know Jesus. So we're just going to walk you through. But, but in order to establish our legitimacy, we got to take it back to the unseen one. So before we go any further, this is the genealogy of Jesus Christ. In other words, <laughs> he didn't just come here. These are his people, and those are his people, and those are his people. And they go all the way back to the unseen one. And the unseen one predates Christianity. It predates all the, the tradition. So when you rebuke this in the name of Jesus, you calling the unseen thing. 
And that's why the internet ain't messed up since we've been talking. So you might as well keep talking. <laughs> on that, on that, Dr. Carr, yes. Um, evil. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I've been contemplating what is, what is, someone said, it's human nature. It's human nature for us to be evil. That's human yes. nature. Yes. I, I say that that's animal nature. I think mm. human nature, I think human nature is to love. That's what makes us human. Human yes. nature is to think. Human nature is to restrain. Human nature is to be disciplined. So when we work, this is how I feel. And I don't know if I'm right. I just, you know, no. I, I, I put forth a theory. If, if I treat people the way I want to be treated, which is, you know, in the Bible, the golden rule or whatever, that's not in the Bible, but Yes. You know, if, if, if I love people the way I want to be loved, if, if I <laughs> want the best for people, what would happen? So I, I went on this journey a couple of decades ago. What would happen if, the, if everyone who was in business with me or who was in relationship with me, that their lives are better off for having been in relationship with me? What would happen? And 20 years later, Dr. Carr, I must say, this is just a theory, people thrive when folks have that relationship and it's and it's contagious right so you know there have been a cu couple of bumps and disappointments along the way you go wow really this is how you're receiving this even even here you know every day we come into this space you and i on a saturday with love yeah it's, it's still sometimes met with because that's animal nature at work, not human nature. Human nature would yes. receive good food and say, wow, this is tasty. I don't agree with that. That's fine. <laughs> Let me spit that out. Or I, you know, and you would, you would digest the goodness and share it. I got something good here. Let me share it. That's what human nature would do. Animal nature is some, is that, so what is the carnal and how did, how did the Egyptians handle evil? Because we talked a little bit about that, you know, um, but is there such a thing as evil? What is evil and how do we, how do we contend with it? Evil is such a, um, well, I think he just laid it out. And in fact, you know, it's interesting. I'm not aware of any pre-enslavement African knowledge system. And this goes back to the first conversation you and I ever had when we, before, the, before the plague hit and I was up there in New York, we were talking about that curriculum framework and how we were wrestling over language and that category we tried to develop called ways of knowing. The reason we called it ways of knowing instead of religion was because we didn't want a narrow category for students to ask a question. You know, well, what did black people believe? So we could say the church, the mosque, the, no, 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 that's too small. That's too small. Can we come up with a category that really asked the question, how did African, how do African people know the world? How do we experience the world? So we could create this category called ways of knowing. So students, whatever they're studying, if it's involving us, you can ask yourself, what are some of the ways we've developed to understand the things we can't see, the things we can't explain? How do we get pathways to knowledge? So this question of evil is very important because I'm not aware of any African way of knowing in recorded memory, whether it's written down or more importantly, passed down mouth to ear or through practices and those little fragments, because none of the past is completely recorded. Everything that we think we know from human beings before us contains more omissions than it does inclusions. Anything, anytime you write something down, you've excluded everything else except this thing you wanted to focus, right? So, but I'm not aware of any trace of memory from African experiences in which evil, prior to enslavement, in which the concept of evil is held as an absolute that exists outside of the person. In other words, the, the, the idea of errant behavior, the idea of behavior that is less than ideal, is included in the human personality. So to make, to make a very uh, inelegant... Uh-oh, we don't want to talk about this. Hold on, pause for a second, Doc. To make a very hold on, British hold on, hold on. And, to... and, and overstated... Hold on, I have to rebuke this in the name of Jesus again. Internet's unstable because we're talking about something I think we're supposed to be talking Rebuke. about. I'm rebuking in the name of Jesus. All right, continue. Right. Yes, you were saying. That's right. And here it is. We good. You no question. <laughs> so, 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 so it's evil is in us. In other words, evil is the concept 
But that's only the word we have been introduced to because we were sucked into, sucked into it over the last four or 500 years through enslavement, through not even enslavement, through captivity. Again, words have great power. People say, oh, we were slaves. No, you were never a slave. You were a captive. You were a victim in a war, an ongoing war. Did you, did you lose your humanity? No. Then are you a slave? No. In fact, when I was a kid, one of the worst things you called somebody was a slave. That's a schoolyard fight. I was 12 years old when Roots came on TV and we was coming back to that integrated school every morning and it was we was handing out whippings. I mean, we, it was like we was blaming the white kids for everything we see on the Tuesday night, Wednesday morning. We ain't here. I mean, I'm sure there were many white people in America who can go back to 1977 and remember being confronted by black children. I don't know how y'all handled it up there in Jersey, but we was like, what? You see somebody get well, did you? I don't, uh -uh. But if you called somebody a slave or called somebody Toby, you been ready to fight. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Toby, what, what? So if that's the reaction, then why would you think your people who actually went through that would ever just say, okay, I'm a slave? No, they were people, they were captive. And you know they were captive because they had to pass all kind of laws and treat, be real brutal. Because if you looked away for two minutes, you were at them, they gone. <laughs> You know, your, your dog stayed here. The human being ran. Meaning what? Let's be clear. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? These are never slaves. These are people who've been enslaved. So anyway, so the idea of evil was something that we took because they forced our languages out of our mouths. And then our children and our children's children ultimately were not introduced to the languages. So evil came to be the label that represented that thing that is in us. In other words, that thing that is about errant behavior, less than ideal behavior, not being generous, not being inclusive, but that's in us too, which is why I don't know if, you, if your pops did this, you know, my, my, my mom was famous for this. If you started acting crazy, she'd be like, all right, now don't, you better stop with all that devilment. Or they, they had names for all that kind of thing, you know what I'm saying? In other words, there's a thing in you that you have the capacity to embrace that will make you go left. And there's a thing in you that you have the capacity to embrace that will allow you to go straight. So it's interesting because the Egyptians, and you know, we talked about this before, that, that whole battle let me, of, I, let me just pause you as, as you're please. saying this. You, you just used the Latin word, left, left is sinister, right? Left, uh, so, yeah. so to go left or straight. So you already, you have embraced in the language. It's just so natural how we just speak things out there, right? So for centuries, left-handedness was, was, you know, embraced by you know it was like that's evil if you're left-handed you're evil and it's latin right and you you go left or you go straight you just said yes. something that, what does that mean you know i just i just oh. wanted to pause there for a second actually no 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 that's very important because you're absolutely right we have we they that is how it has been dictated to us and it's because in part left-handedness is uh, uh the minority of people are left-handed apparently since the beginning of people so the question is, this is actually, this is very good. This is, actually, this is a very important, very important observation you just made. Yes, thank you for slowing us down on that because we're all human, all born, all die, reproduce, move on. So the only question culture raises is, how do humans in different places on this ball we call the globe, how do we understand our experiences? That's all culture is. So how did Africans, and, and again, this is a big label on a, a, a part of the world. It's 20% of the world's land mass, billion, 0.25 people now, looking about two and a half billion in 50 years. So we know it's not all one people. We know that. But on this land mass, when you point to a specific place, how did they understand, let's say, left-handedness? It's very interesting. If you look at a map of Africa and go to the middle of Africa, the belly of Africa, the Kikongo, Bakongo, Abumbundu, looks like the Democratic Republic of Congo in the middle, then you go to the east, Rwanda, Burundi, you go to the west, it's, uh, it's uh, the Congo Republic, and then, and then go further down, it's Angola. How did those people and different people in that region, which is bi as big as the United States, bigger really, if you look up through all the way across, how did those people understand left-handedness? Well, the Kikongo people, what well, they would call Kikongo people. Uh, let me see. Yeah, here we go. Let's go. My man. Oh, Baba Kukia. We talked about Kukia. This is the one. African cosmology of the Bantu Congo. 
right? That's Kuki Al. This is a very important brother. We talked about him before. See, we, we have him, right? But he was the major informant for Robert Ferris Thompson. Robert Ferris Thompson, this is his book, Flash of the Spirit. Robert Ferris Thompson is a white dude out of Texas we talked about before as well. This is a good book because this book, Flash of the Spirit, and I use it in my Black Aesthetics class. In fact, I'm using it again this semester. That same class Michelle broke up by rebuking everything in the name of Jesus since all outside. So <laughs> he, he, he divides into several chapters dealing with different groups. So he's got Congo, he's got Yoruba, he's got Akan, he's got uh, very interesting people. Mande, in his chapter, The Sign of the Four Moments of the Sun, and I don't know if I actually pulled any of that because I got all of Robert Ferris Thompson's books. By the way, in terms of that Beyonce link, that's that book that Beyonce holds up that we talked about, Black Gods and Kings. That's Robert Ferris Thompson. Actually, this is the whole book he wrote on it called The Four Moments of the Sun. So, Because what the Kikongo people would say is, here is the sun at, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. Here is the sun at sunrise. The sun rises, it goes to noon, it sets, and then it goes to midnight. Then it comes back. This is the revolution of the sun, but it's also the re revolution of our lives. You're born, you reach full powers of adulthood, you pass away, become an ancestor, you go back to the land of the ancestors. There's a line here that the Kikongo people say, this is water. Beneath this is everything that exists. Above this is everything we can see. So you always go back to this, then you always come back. That's why when a baby is born, when a baby is born, you have to wait to see who she is. You can't just name that baby at the hospital. You got to wait. Why? Because that baby came back from here, meaning every ancestor. And of course, what do they teach us in science? A woman is born with every egg she will ever have, meaning what? She already here with her great, 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 great grandchildren. Do you understand the power of how these Africans understood the world? You, know, you came here. You, you came out your mother's womb. You already got your children with you. You just got to get old enough to have them. You know what I'm saying? So, but guess what? Since you came back from here, we don't know who you are yet. Watch her. Well, she behaves not like her mother. She behaved like your great grand. You didn't know your mother didn't know her grandma, great grandmother. I knew her because that was my mother. Your name is Yemi. In other words, we know we got a name. We can't just name you coming out the womb, which is why the Africans always have more than one name. You can have a name when you're born, but we got to wait and give you some more names. And so it's very. And then of course the Christian missionaries come along, and that's why you see so many Nigerians named Christian and Mercy and all that. And they'll tell you, my name is Mercy. Young in my class, you know, I have everybody introduce themselves. What's your name? My, my, my name is um, Mercy Balogun. Balogun, ah, that's a Yoruba name, yeah. Okay, what's your other name? If you don't mind sharing with us. You see a little smile. Okay, you don't have to tell us all your names. Tell us one more name if you're all right with that. They say, okay, my name is Yemi Tunde. Okay, what does that mean? Say, Where did that name come from? Say, and I know you got another name, we won't talk about that now, because one of the things you also see is, Many, many African cultures have what, some, what we might call in Ebonics, a name name, meaning what? There's a name you have that only your grandmother can call you. In other words, this ain't a name you got on the birth certificate. This ain't an official name. This is the pet name she gave you. And when you hear that name, and if somebody overhear that name and try to say it, you fight them. Bit, bit. Well, you can't call me that. <laughs> words, right. Only my That's auntie right. calls me. In other words, right. these are, right. the Africans are so sophisticated with naming. But anyway. What does it have to do with left-handedness? Very important. <laughs> Notice how this circle goes. Here, 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 here. The Europeans would call that counterclockwise. The Africans would say, why is your circle going this way? In other words, the sun comes this way. Why you got an instrument that looks this way? Clockwise is backwards. <laughs> In other words, but the sun goes from east to west. And so the important thing to understand is when you're moving what we would call left, and then think about this, we got a clock on the wall. When we go view a body, we go this way. We get the right hand of fellowship, and it's we go this way. <laughs> we don't, we know, we kept yeah. that with us, you know what I'm saying? Even though we weren't the and, and even the Muslims, they pray when they pray toward the east. Right, they praying toward this. You bury people toward the east for the sunrise. And 
when the Africans who were enslaved in places like South Carolina, other places, you get some Muslims on those boats. So the first African-American Muslims obviously are not the ones that come with the Nation of Islam or Noble Drali. They're the ones who came over on the boat. Phyllis Wheatley from Senegal, that was Muslim territory. She's probably Islamic. She writes about that in her poetry. So it's interesting. Michael Gomez writes about this in his book, uh, uh, Exchanging Our Country Marks. Brilliant, brother. Up there, up there where you are at NYU. Been there for many years. Taught at Spelman College at NYU. One of, the great, uh, one of the great responsibilities I feel like in my professional career, I've been able to send Michael Gomez students uh, to him to help train them. Uh, uh, Natalie Pierre, who is Haitian, she's in Brooklyn right now. I got a PhD under Mike Gomez. My first student from New Orleans, who we were able to send her, Rashana Johnson. She's on faculty at University of Chicago now. She was at Dartmouth. Came out of New Orleans. This sister raised in the church wanted to know where these spiritual traditions come from, wrote her dissertation on slavery and the idea of culture and power in New Orleans, but Michael Gomez trained her after we finished with Howard. But Gomez writes in his book, he has a book called Exchanging Our Country Marks, and he talks about the fact that these Muslims were embraced differently by the European enslavers because they said, you know, y'all are not Christians, but you have a book. So you're more civilized than these Negroes who ain't got no book. We, we are not Muslims, the Christian, these white Christians. We're not Muslims, but we understand you got a text, you have rituals. So therefore, we might make you all the foreman. We might put y'all in the house. I mean, you know, it's, the white supremacy is so damn devious in terms of these, you know, but they're going to try to, you know, but what did they do? Now, they're going to train all of them. You must now embrace this Bible. And in our book, the white Christian book, you all are not human. But if you embrace this book, and call on God and Jesus the way we see it, you can now become Christian and your soul can be saved because you came from heathen Africa. Heathen from the Greek word ethnic, which is, no, actually, ethne is the origin in the Greek. It's the same root that we get for heathen is the same root word that we get for ethnic. In other words, other. Other than what? Other than white. Heathen. What? Other than what? Other than Christian. In other words, they othering people and saying, if you don't believe what we believe, but if you believe what we believe, you, you, you're going to die a slave, they would say. But you can be born again as a human. So therefore, a born again for eternal life, but you got to worship us. Oh, and by the way, take this white Jesus, because that's the master. See me? See Jesus? We the same. So when you die, you'll be serving us again, but you'll be living forever. So they try to skip. What do the Africans do, though? They take this Bible, and here's where the Congo thing gets very interesting. They, and the Congo aren't alone. I'm just using the Congo as an example. So they're saying this is water that separates what you can't see from what you can. And we all come from what you can't see. But this water here, if you go, you're going to, when you die, you're going back there, and then you're coming back. So when they tell these Africans, oh, you got to baptize you, they was like, wait, water, and then we come back? Yeah, oh, yeah, okay, that's cool. Yeah, we know that part. <laughs> We're born again. We come back up out this water. No question. That's it. And so, but the Muslims find ways to hide Islam in the face of these Christian slave masters. And they are also exchanging, because when Gomez says country marks, what he means is ways of knowing. In other words, this is my country mark. This is what I believe. Okay, this is my country mark. This is what I believe. Okay, we're going to swap country marks. And when they tell us Christianity, we're going to go ahead with that ritual, but we're really going to be doing our thing. So you ever heard that song? We sit in church and they sing, Lord, have mercy on me. Lord, have mercy on me. May the Lord have mercy on me. When I fall on my knees with my face to the rising sun, oh, Lord, have mercy. That's the Muslims making salat. But they done fooled these white Christians into thinking, oh, they're praying. No, we got to make salat at the sunrise. So when I fall on my knees with my face to the rising sun, I'm doing my Muslim thing. But you fools think I'm a Christian. So I mean, so they're exchanging their country marks under, in the face of these people. But this is where we'll go with left-handedness. As you're moving in this direction, if you come out of your mother's womb left-handed, that signals to many of these different ways of knowing you got a connection to what we can't see that is different than the rest of us. So that can elicit on a, on a continuum two reactions, great respect and admiration or great fear. <laughs> but the power, so the question is, how do you deal with left-handedness? Some cultures, they force you to use your right hand. 
because <laughs> we can't have nobody out because we don't know you know if you keep up that up are you a are you a seer are you a witch are you some cultures they say no you're the one who has another level of sight and we know the person with other levels of sight we say sometimes black folk love saying this this is classic in ebonics that child been here before <laughs> in other words <laughs> you know little girl comes say no nah, don't do that but what you know what that right there she's been here before you know this going back to the thing we all been here before but that one knows it in other words so wow. listen to that child you know what i'm saying she's been here for no she's aware even if she isn't fully aware so the question of left-handedness when i say go left what it really is is almost a, a phrase that we use to say you've now gone off into a thing that if you can't control it it's going to overwhelm you if you're going left, you better be somebody that can control going left. And who can control going left? Who can control going straight? Who sit, oh yeah. The other thing finally, at this little, at this rotation, remember, if you got four moments of the sun, this also makes a cross. So when the Christian missionaries came with that cross with Jesus on it, they looking like, oh, wait, this cat right here sits at the cross. You put, he's in control of all this? Yeah, okay, we can get with that guy. Why? Because anybody sit at the crossroads, <laughs> anybody on the crossroads has full power over the whole diagram. So if you got a guy on the crossroad, in fact, there's a long tradition of what they call Congo with a K, K-O-N-G-O, Congo crosses. Once the missionaries came and the Congo people saw that guy, they started making crosses with their own image of that Jesus. So you got all these black Jeses on these crosses from the 18th, 17th, 19th century. And so the Christian missionaries said, we've turned them into Christians. They said, y'all can't see us? This thing is bigger than you. Yeah, this book y'all done brought now. They said, but this cat right here, we knew this dude. And it ain't always a dude. Do you understand <laughs> who somebody said? And for the and for the Yoruba people, it's Eshu. Eshu is the one. In fact, Robert Ferris Thompson talks about this, and this is where we're going with this question. He talk about evil and how we behave. Because whoever sits at the crossroads isn't just good. That, that, that figure embodies the full potential of existence. So that means evil is in there too. We go to, we go to Sunday school, we used to get in arguments when I was a teenager, you probably did it younger. I mean, we, we would try to figure out, okay, so Jesus came in and saw them selling stuff and he turned over all the tables. He had a bull whip. He drew. Man, I, but I thought Jesus was kind. No, 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 no. That's the, what you would call. E no, that's the G in him. <laughs> I don't like gangster. Do you understand what Jesus did when he came in there and saw them people? That Jesus said, could you please in the name of my father? No, you get this shot. I told y'all. <laughs> no, don't mistake. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? There is something. Jesus is in control of all this. When I went to, um, oh my goodness. When I went to um, Brazil, first time I went to Brazil, only time I've been to Brazil, I went down there and I was in the marketplace and the, I'm looking because I thought I had one of the, I pulled some of the African arts uh, books because I thought, you know, I have the full run of African arts. It's, it's, a, it's a magazine, actually there are hundreds of them that's been published since the late 60s. African arts is a good book. Like if you want to stand Beyonce stuff, a lot of it came, you know, you can see the imagery and things like there's a lot of Dogon stuff. You see the horns, all this stuff in her thing. Rituals like these brothers, brother got to pay respect. This is just the covers of the magazines. But I'm trying to think if I have a, I wish I had a, oh, maybe a shoe. I think that shoe is here. If I can get this out. That's all right. I got so much stuff over here, but it's all right. A shoe, uh, oh no, this is not the good one. This is a shoe. In a minute, I wish I could find, if I could find a good one, I would show you quickly, but I don't think I, oh, wait, wait, what am I saying? Robert Ferris Thompson has a picture. He should have a picture in here. The, the idea is that when you have, when I was in Brazil, I went to the marketplace and I could have swore, oh yeah, here we go. Here's one. See that double blade X on the top of this figure. And I'm gonna come back to this. This is a woman. I'm gonna come back to her in a minute. When you see that double blade, that's often um, Shango. In other words, Shango is like in the Yoruba so-called pantheon, the Orisha, the Odu Ifa. Shango controls the thunder. 
and the lightning. Now, those people in the Marvel Universe think of Thor, but long before Thor was even thought of, long before Odin, don't even worry about them people. But the thunder, so forget that hammer and that, no, no, we're talking about Shango, this is the Africans doing that, right? So some people still trapped by the notion of European world, we would say, oh, Shango, it's like an African Thor. No, nah, no, nah, but if you got to compare, then you would call Thor a uh, European Shango. So let's just be clear. So Shango got this thunder. To control that thunder, you have to have that strength and that passion. That can cut a lot of ways. If, if, if it goes, like I said, if it go left, if you can't control it, one thing Shango has is this incredible passion for women. He loved making love. He got all these girlfriends. Stuff. But there's one woman that, you know, he in love with who will walk away from him, Oshun. I mean, there's many stories about this Oshun, right? Now, Oshun, by the way, when you see Beyonce in that yellow, when you see Beyonce, Oshun, right? So when you see her even with, with the critique of Jay-Z and stuff, okay, Jay-Z got the Shago energy, but I'm Oshun, meaning what? I know you done been out with all these women, but I, you keep coming back. Why you keep coming back to me? Why? Because I got the thing, you can't move around. In fact, let's just tie our young sisters in who went left with it because they can't really control it. Uh, Megan and Cardi B, wop. So understand this in the sense, you got, I got that thing you can't walk away from. By the way, water. In fact, these are the women who, you get a book like this, Mommy Wata. Mami Wata is very good because this book talks about arts for water spirits in Africa and its diasporas. This is just one of hundreds of books that talk about the woman as Mami Wata, which is a gloss of the women in many African and diasporic African traditions that deal with this question of power as it relates to water. Because remember, the Congo people who ain't got, who are not nowhere near the Yoruba people anywhere on the continent of Africa, so Africa's not the same. If they're not the same, how come they keep coming up with these similar themes? Come on, y'all. So, and then they all get put on a boat and have to change their country marks over here. And the next thing you know, you want to understand why you keep seeing us getting baptized and stuff or keep getting drenched and stuff. And even when it go completely left and you say, yeah, I got this wet. Oh, wait, wait, what do it? Yeah, wet, water, women, power. And so Shango, who walking through the world doing whatever the hell he want, but he keep coming back to Oshun. There are stories in the Oduifa where finally he come up and then one time she drowns him. <laughs> and then brings him back. Meaning what? I'm not gonna kill you, but you gotta understand something. <laughs> You're not gonna disrespect me. I'm in charge and, but I know that's your nature, which is why she can't resist him. Her time, in other words, they, they, there's, this, there's this dance, but it's all a metaphor for our individual human desire. And so people say, well, why? Why, that's crazy. But no, yeah, it's crazy. But if you go back 40 years to Teddy Pendergrass begging on that almost nine minute version of I miss you, you understand Shango and <laughs> in other words, oh, I swear I didn't change. No, you keep coming back because, because WAP, if you go left, is a kind of, kind of a very narrow, only call it vulgar, a very narrow illusion to that elemental power that if you can go straight, like when we really studied and understood and apprenticed, which is very important, you can understand it. But I don't want to, um, let, me, let me tie this together because I really want to get back to the, uh, well, I haven't left it, but I want to make this, underscore the point that you made earlier, that you were talking about evil and the question of this, how can we, can, can we control evil and what does it mean to be generous? So here it is. If you're at the crossroads, and like I said, well, this, uh, when I was in Brazil, I saw, a statue, I'm in the market, and I saw a statue of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ holding this in his hand. And it was an old man sitting there. And I don't speak, I speak very little Portuguese. You know, obrigado, thank you, boy, noche, good evening. It is this kind of thing, can I eat something here? So I see the guy say, huh. I say, Jesus. He said, see, sí. yeah. I said, ah, Shango. He said, see. Sí. Yes. In other words, they're not distinct. Jesus has that too. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But Jesus is the guy that can drive you out. And he's also the guy when he's sitting there between them two people. And the guy said, look, like James Cleveland said, well, I, I don't know whether you're the son of God or not. But if you come in your kingdom, remember me. He said, this day you will be with me in paradise. Lord, I'm here. I can bring you with me. <laughs> in other words, I'm the guy at the court. But to sit at that crossroads means you have the capacity to, to direct, to channel, you're aware of the, the, the ashe, the, 
the awareness of our moon. You're at the center of that thing. And for the Yoruba people, that is Eshu. And Eshu, this is a book on Eshu. Eshu, the divine, they would call him a trickster. You see, they would call Eshu a trickster in the European. But that's because they would call him a trickster the same way they talk about good and evil, which is why going back, remember uh, uh, many weeks ago, we talked about Bugs Bunny. Bugs Bunny is the Eshu character. He's at that crossroads. He's not evil, but he gonna irritate you to choose which way you going left, you going straight. Cause I'm here, I'm in control of the crossroad. So I'm gonna say, you know, uh, duck seed, rabbit season, and you gonna say duck season, and you're gonna say and then I'm gonna call your name and you're gonna shoot yourself. Why? Because you done got so caught up. See, I'm in control. You're not, you can't kill me. Every time, Elmer, you come with the gun to kill me, you shoot yourself. Why? Because I'm at the crossroads. You're the one making the choice between what you would call good and evil. And if you pick evil, it's going to backfire on you, which is the, which is the broader lesson. So why then pick, ever pick evil? What you should do, and I said I was going to use this picture again. What you should always do is what Robert Ferris Thompson shows us in this picture. Now, you see this is a woman with this on her hand, on her head. Can you see what's in her hands? Her breasts. Exactly. And you see how she has them? Yes. To be feed. To feed. Yes. She's, she's offering them. In other words, the thing in life is not to be evil. The thing in life is to be generous. And when you look at African art, you can't just, oh, this is an interesting picture. No, no, no. The Africans wrote in and on everything. So you look at a piece of statuary in a museum. Okay, let's move on. Stop. You can't even read what that is. They don't make any uh, they don't make any unintentional gestures. You open your hand. You open your cap. In fact, he talks about, you know, when you meet somebody on the road, you open your cap. You open your hand. In fact, somebody doesn't have a ticket. They outside the club. They look inside. They see their girl in there. What do we do? <laughs> in other words, generosity. Don't turn your back. I'm not on the list. Key, key. <laughs> what do we do? When what somebody you know about, what you know about that, Doctor Carl? What you know, what I'm just saying, you know, what you know, know. What we do. We and <laughs> what what do we do? The Southern Africans, Zulu, have a, a phrase that translates "I see you." We kept that, even though we weren't taken from that region. You uh, see somebody, the child, I see you. Meaning what? Move everything away. You and me spiritually. I I see you. I I support you. We are together in this, girl. I saw you. I see you. I see you, August Wilson. You shining like new money. In other words, I recognize the generosity in your performance, the generosity in your spirit. Those that close off die when you greedy. And this isn't exclusive to Africans. Charles Dickens writes about it in Christmas Carol. That's, that's the whole story, Ebenezer Scrooge. If you're going to be an a-hole, you're going to take an L. Why? And you know what it's going to take? You need to go to sleep. Why? You need to do what we do every day. What Robert Ferris Thompson and says the Congo people understood. Because when you go to sleep, you're going beneath. In other words, you wake up, you do your business, you go to sleep, you hear, you come back. Scrooge went to sleep. And he came back, born again. In other words, the Congo are like, I don't know why these Europeans think they got a monopoly on philosophy. We've been doing this a lot longer than they have. But then when you bring them off the boat, claim they are slaves, say anything they have is of no value, and then try somehow to put your mind in their mind. They have to hide their mind, and you look up in 400 years, and, and so much of what you claim is yours is them that informed you on everything, but they never, and they even forgot it was theirs. So now they give you credit for stuff they gave you. <laughs> your music, your food, your philosophy, your generosity, your damn democracy. Because the thing about democracy is they never built a system where everybody could participate. It took the African and the indigenous people to, to be brought into this field of violence to say, no, what is this thing, voting? You say vote? What is a vote? A vote means everybody has some say. Oh, okay. Well, then everybody should have some say. Well, not you. Why? You a slave. Okay. Well, I'm going to have a vote. Well, what about, okay, so all of y'all have a vote? Well, no, not really. I own property, so I have a vote. See that white man there? He don't have no properties. He don't have a vote. Uh, see my wife? She don't have a vote. So the Africans looking like, well, this is, oh, no, 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 no. First of all, can I go home? No. Okay. <laughs> can I be left Can I be left alone? No. Okay. You, 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 I can't go home, and you won't leave me alone. Well, then, damn it. 
I'm going to change your stuff. And then, because see, this is the thing. After the Civil War, they never asked us whether we wanted to be left alone or go home. This is what Mario Bedelli calls the plebiscite question in his book, America, the Nation State. This is one of the, the chief architects of the reparations conversation. He said the first thing they should have done at the Civil War is say, look, it's over. Y'all ain't enslaved no more. Who wants to go back to Africa? Okay, you don't want to go. Most of y'all don't want to go. Okay, some of y'all want to go. Okay, good. Now, y'all staying here? Okay, who wants to come with us? Y'all don't want to, you want your own town? You want your, yeah. And we started doing that. But so then when they said, okay, but we want this vote thing though. Why? Because the concept of vote is everybody's in it. So we believe everybody should be in it. Then Susan B. Anthony will come up and say, oh yeah, we believe it too, but you, but white men, you should give it to your wives and daughters before you give it to Sambo. And Sojourner Truth and them is like, no, I'm a woman too. Hold up, hold up. Either we all voting or ain't nobody voting. And so even democracy, I don't even call it democracy. I don't like thinking about the, dem the demos and Greek and nation state, because it was never everybody, even with the Greeks. The, the Athenians and Spartans, no. I like to call what they call democracy. No, this is the African nation, Africanization and the indigenization of the Western traditions because the, the Native Americans had the same thing. Remember last week, a couple weeks ago now, where they had the, at, the, at the convention. Now, you, we can set aside Kamala Harris and Joe Biden and all the political theater, and yeah, they gave AOC five seconds and Bernie Sanders 10 seconds, and then the Republicans are out, whatever, John Meacham and all them. But when they did the roll call of the 57 states and territories, it was the most non-white thing of the whole convention. They did the whole theater. Man, the guy from New Mexico was like, respect our sovereignty. I said, oh, I see. They just let y'all take whatever the hell they want. Because they, they ain't even listening to what y'all say. I'm watching this like, see, th if this was America, we might be able to talk. Because now you, know, you got everybody doing their thing, right? When they got to Oklahoma, it was the people from Black Wall Street. You covered them. I mean, all of them say, like, look at these people from Tulsa. So anyway, the one of the sisters who is indigenous, who is now in the United States Congress, she said, yeah, my ancestors came here, and I forget what she said. I think she said uh, 1200, maybe 1200 AD, escaping famine or something. Yeah, and then she started talking, and then she said at the end, she said, so as a 34th or 35th, whatever she's a generation American, what I'm saying is, you know, and I'm listening to her like, sis, I love how you've reframed it, but you didn't even go far enough. Why? Because it wasn't America when your people came here. It don't need for you to take that label. I understand you taking the label because you are saying y'all came to my my land and in my land, we believed everybody should vote. We believe everybody should eat. In other words, you're getting a little closer to what was going on before y'all ran over here and then brought my cousins on those boats. And I'm saying that's the direction this project is going in. It's going to overflow and overrun the Federalist Papers, the Constitution. It's going to overrun George Washington them because they didn't bring that idea from Europe. The Africans and the indigenous people say everybody should be. And at the core of it, finally, at the core of it is not evil. At the core of it is generosity. Because if it is not built on generosity, if you make the decision at that crossroad to go left, if you make that decision, you can't control that because you don't have a character to control and, and character is very big too. We can talk about that in a second as well because the Yoruba people they will call that um, Iwa, I W A. Iwa is character. They say the purpose of being on the earth for humans is to work on your character, and character is the ability to choose generosity over evil. That's, that's, what, that's, what, that's what that's about. I know that's true. I know that's true. I, and it, and it, you thank you for that confirmation. Thank you for the confirmation. No. So, we're going to talk about Beyonce. Yeah. And I still, I still haven't watched. I still I still can't watch it. And and so maybe I'm Tell not me even. Tell some more watching. about that. What, what's, okay. what's so when I when I watch it, it takes me spiritually to a place that make, feels dark, and yes. feels heavy. Yes. And I I don't want to be in that place. And so I don't yep. know why. And I keep trying to go back to it. And I feel that way. So if I'm feeling a way that's not um that doesn't make me feel good spiritually, I, I have to turn. I have to say something's either wrong with me or wrong with that, which I'm watching. Mm. And so I'm going to always probably say something wrong with that, which I'm watching. Because <laughs> I'm doing the work character-wise. So I hold up yeah. and say, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Something's wrong with what I'm watching. And it, it, it doesn't settle right with my spirit. Now, I'm not saying Beyonce is evil. Right. But that which she is projecting 
in, in a space for Disney that also has Lion King connections. And I know that all, but she's, she's jamming these, we've talked about this before, these image, images and, and these stories into something that feels incongruent to me. So you, you broke this down with your birth brother, with your born brother, with your- Yeah, we did. Pastor we brother. Did. We, talk, we talked about it a little bit, but we didn't, we, we talked about it in a way because he's a minister. And so we had a different kind of conversation kind of building some in terms of what we've been talking about but in anticipation that we're going to talk about when we you know have a live interaction with our with our with our family um i think we can get into a little bit more technical okay conversation right. about that um what was the word you just used incongruent i think that's very important i think that's very important in fact because there's a sense of symmetry. In fact, it's very important. One, one of the chapters in Flash of the Spirit, Robert Perez Thompson talks about is the Mende people. And he talks about what he calls offbeat phrasing. In other words, in many African ways of knowing, you have what we might call syncopation. In music, the offbeat phrasing. We know we, we can keep a beat in our head, even though the beat is changing. We know the central beat. So as long as, it, 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 and the other people, it just sounds crazy. No, you can't, you got to hear the rhythm. You got to hear the beat, right? So even, you know, uh, when they had that song, all I do is win, 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 no matter what, right? Everybody hand go up. And they say that, we never stop counting in our head. But up, two, three, four, one. And it's, you know, we, we know where the beat is. As long as you know where the beat is, it can get all kind of complicated. Scott Joplin, you name all the jazz. As long as the, in fact, but if you can't figure out the underlying rhythm, it sounds discombobulated. And it's not something that's ear pleasing to the ear. It sounds disjointed, as you say. It sounds, you know, so even, and this happens even within communities. Cab Calloway, Baltimore's great Cab Calloway, right? When Dizzy Gillespie, John Burke's Blessing Boys came up from South Carolina out in there, and there young guys in the band, right? You know, Dizzy is there, Mario, Mario Bowser and all them, they playing. And, when they first come, they gonna play whatever Cab and them say play. They got the big bands, Cab Calloway and Chewberry, uh, what's his name? Um, um, uh, just called Billy X Time. Mr. B. They got these big bands. But then Cab, uh, uh, Dizzy Gillespie, Thelonious Monk out of North Carolina, all these guys, they young guys. They wanna play some, Mary Lee Williams coming out of it. They wanna, so after hours, they go uptown, Minton's Playhouse, whatever. They playing that stuff that becomes, we end up knowing as Bebop. Cab and them can't really follow the fact, and here's where, and some people, many people, you know, Gillespie would say that, Sandy Crouch has written about it, so many others, you know, coming out of Kansas City, uh, Missouri, Charlie Parker, and he said Charlie Parker would take the melody and take the chords, strip everything out but the chords, which he kept in his mind, and play the changes. So instead of, you know, how high the moon, Somewhere there's heaven, a happy tune. Somewhere there's music, how high the moon. He said, no, I'm here. So I'll play. I'm listening to the song in my head, but I'm playing between the chords, right? So Cap Calloway hears that. And he said, tell y'all playing. That's not what the, he called it Chinese music. He says, Chinese, get out of my band. <laughs> we can't dance to that. The dancers are saying, what's the sister's name? She just, Norma Jean uh, uh, Cole, was it? I got her book back there. Um, she and her dance partner, you know, they were used to the swing. You know what I'm saying? They used to, uh, uh, Ella Fitzgerald took over his band after he died. He was from Cal, the little fella. Um, oh, it'll come, Chick, Chick Webb. Chick Webb's orchestra. You know, Count Basie and them with that one o'clock jump. Yeah, we we dancing. Yeah, then these cats come along, bop, bop, but but we can't dance to that. <laughs> In other words, I don't know that. And then eventually they grew to appreciate it, but it's not dance music. So you if you can't follow that rhythm, and this, mind you, is from masters, which is why ultimately it gets folded into the long arc of African music. Which is why when, when Duke Ellington, they say, well, it's jazz. He said, I don't call it jazz. Well, you call it, I call it music. Yeah, but what does that mean? He said, you know what this music is? It's music with an African foundation 
interpreting this American experience. So, you know, so Duke Ellington, y'all not, what y'all not gonna do is fold my music exclusively into your category. In fact, there's a, there's a, there's a book on Duke Ellington, it's called Beyond Category. Cause you see, my, my music is beyond category. But what it really means is, is beyond your categories. Cause I know, so, so when you're watching, when I'm watching, when we're watching Black is King, I think one of the things we're watching is a young sister and her collaborators who are now aware. First of all, they were born Africans, wherever they were born, whether it's Texas or Lagos, Nigeria. They were born Africans, different Africans to be sure. Nigerian is not a Texan and vice versa. But they share enough of, this is why Robert Ferris Thompson and, and calls his book Flash of the Spirit. In other words, it ain't all the same, but there are flashes. You see a flash over, you see those girls jumping rope. Damn, I thought I saw something like that in, uh, in Nubia. You did, but it's not quite the same. No, it's a flash. In other words, these are flashes of who these people are. They flashes everywhere. So they're born into these flashes that are specific to where they are. Beyonce, daddy taking her to see Texas Southern March Band. You know, she's growing up in this culture of the Gulf South, this kind of thing. And so there's that. Then there is the lowest common denominator, the rhythm of our experiences. So what do you have? You know, yeah, the lyrics may be crazy, which is why it, 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 makes, me, it makes me wince. At the same time, it makes me smile because here's Snoop. Now he's Uncle Snoop. He's an older guy now. He's beloved. Y'all don't remember but O's and tricks. No, that beat is going to draw every African in the world all, every time, and all the other human beings who respond to that beat. And what you say over that beat is going to draw them right into you going left, because you can't control. That beat is elemental. You're going to tap into the ashe, the amun, the, and, then, and once you got us, what you say next is going to come in our ear and poison every, or it's going to come in our ear and inspire us. But Fortunately, you don't make songs like that anymore, but the simple fact of the matter is you did at the beginning, and that's what drew all these young people's attention, because their frontal, their frontal part of their brain ain't, ain't developed fully yet. And so they're going to come to the beat. Doo doo brown, doo doo brown. Okay, they're going to come to that, or they're going to come to a brother who was a, uh, he was actually a, um, a drill sergeant. No, 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 he wasn't. No, he wasn't. He left the army because they would not promote him. But he, he was calling cadences. In the military, this is like the 1980s. He was calling cadences in the military so uh, so powerfully, tapping into. There's another thing in in music, uh, and I'm not, you know, I, like like I said before, I play music. You know, I love music, but you know, so I, but I, I, I leave to professionals the interpretation. But it's something called a blue note, and and, and they they call it. Blue. There's many labels for it, but the idea is you've got the pentatonic scale. I mean, the, the scale like that. But as you go up and down the scale in the Western sense, they would call the notes between those whole notes on the scale, you know, are those flats, are they sharps? Are they... But the Africans are like, no, it's all sounds and vibrations, and we wouldn't name it that way. So there are notes that they would say, well, that's a note between. Is that a flat or is that a sharp? But that blue note, I mean, I just I always give my students an example from like, because Motown was good at mixing blue notes with the traditional note. So you hear like Diana Ross and Supremes, Baby love, my baby love, I need you. Here come the blue note. Oh, how I need your love. <laughs> oh, wait, what was that? Yeah, y'all ain't got that in Bach and baby. I mean, or you do, you got, or, or, and then Marvin Gaye, of course, he just used all blue notes. I've been really trying, hey. What's that trying? That's that church, that's that blue note. That's the note you sing in church that you can't write on a score. See, yeah, that's all reason, right? Because you playing the blue notes. That's the note that hits you right here. That's that vibration that puts you right there. So the brother who was calling cadences, even though he was not a drill sergeant, his name was um oh, what was that man's name? Uh it'll come to me anyway. It'll come to me. The, the song, you know the song. Hold on, let me think. Al McLaren, Al McLaren, out of New York, came down to Baltimore, 1992 was it, got with a DJ who was on the air in Baltimore, still on the air these days, Frank Ski, and you know this song, he's calling the cadence in the song with the, with the, with the blue note in his throat, so you know how they do, 
Now, they, they would get him out and say, call the case. I'm not a sergeant. No, call the case. We like how you call the case. So he comes down there, and they record a hit that becomes a club hit in Baltimore. There's some whores in this house. There's some whores in this house. <laughs> so you and I both remember when that was the song. That's the one they repeat almost 80 times and what? <laughs> There's some whores in this house. People saying, you, you, what's drawing you in ain't even the words. It's the vibration. It's that blue note. There's some whores. I hate this. I hate this. But why are you moving? Because I can't help it. I hate this. I hate it. So, so, so the idea that it's demonic is really coming from the impulse that you have pulled me to the crossroads and you can't control it. Mm. So in other words, Megan, Cardi, Juvenile, you know, you name it. The, the, we ain't talking about the same gender. So Nelly, Tip Drill, you have pulled me, Snoop, you have pulled me to the crossroads by calling me into this cultural thing, but you have not, you're not an initiate, you haven't really studied. So you have pulled me into this and you don't have the command to take the next step yet. So now we just all marching off this cliff. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But, but that have not been said. And that's why I think it would be a visceral response. You're pulled in by the color. You're pulled in by the sound. You're pulled in by the visuals. And once you're pulled in, you say, now, where are we going? Oh, wait. Oh, wait. Oh, it's a lot going on here. Oh, wait. Oh, let me stop. Because as Robert Ferris Thompson says about the Mende people, it's syncopated. But if you don't know the rhythm, it can be confusing, which is why. You ever seen a bottle tree, Karen? No. Yeah, you may have, may not have heard it phrased that way. You ever been, in, well, you know, in the South, for example, people will stick Coke bottles of different colors and stuff okay. on trees. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, the bottle tree, right? Why do you put different colored glass on trees or put different colored glass in front of your house, break the bottles and take the bottoms and arrange them? Africans would say, see, this is what happened when, and that by now, they, a lot of them are Christians, right? Now we're talking about the late 19th, early 20th century, these bottle trees. So they done, they converted them to Christianity, but they still got their flash of the spirit. They still got that previous notion of controlling these forces they can't see, including the ones in themselves. So they say, this house here, this is a Christian house. We rise, we wash, we eat, we go out to the farm. But I'm putting this bottle tree out here, why? Because when the devil show up at the house, he gonna get caught in them colors. Because again, all these colors, the devil is the master of confusion. So when you try to come in my house, you're gonna say, oh, whoa, look at all those colors. And you go right over to that bottle tree. That's where we <laughs> trap the evil. In other words, you know what I'm saying? And, and in fact, um, what did uh, uh, Zora Neale Hurston, right? One of the many stories she collected, like Catherine Dunham and so many going through the South, going into the Caribbean, you know, she writes Mules and Men, you know, Zora, uh, Catherine Dunham ends up living in Haiti, right? So Zora Neale Hurston, one of the things she, collected and in fact is one of the newer editions of her collected stories you can't hit uh, a straight line with a crooked stick <laughs> oh boys you can't hit a straight line with a crooked stick in other words what does the crooked represent what does the syncopation represent what does the multicolor represent what does busyness represent in the african diaspora flash it represents evil or bad choices or bad decisions and so when we see WAP or we see Black is King, we see, and I, I made this, we were talking to my brother, when we were talking to my brother, I said, you know, you look at WAP, to me, WAP is like a kindergartner's understanding of those forces. You really don't understand it, but you like, you know, and, you know, it's like, it's like, you, you, you know, and I'm sure, I don't know if this ever happened to you. Did you ever do something as a child that adults told you to stop doing because you weren't old enough to do it? <laughs> Maybe not. You a good girl. No, I wasn't actually. You uh, wasn't a good girl? Then you did it. I was not. No, I was not a good girl. <laughs> Absolutely oh, not. See, see, see. <laughs> no, I, ain't get, I ain't get caught a lot. So that's Okay, see, well, that's it. Well, see, that's the other thing. You gotta be that's actually very interesting. Um, there are many traditions where, for example, the idea is you convene the elders and people say, Well, when can you be initiated into that circle? You can be initiated in the circle when you have when you are old enough to have children who are old enough to have children. In other words, until, you, until you're until you old enough so that your child can have a child, you can't come into this circle. But ultimately, we will all get there. But it's important to understand because that signifies then that you have reached an age where you have the capacity to speak on some things. So when children do something like, little children be out here doing a dance, oh, you ain't old enough yeah. to do that dance. 
Right. Little girl shaking him, shaking her, shaking her leg, and she ain't got no hips. Stop. You know, it's, which is why even well, you know, in, in the in the deep south, like little children, I'm talking about little children, little children, three, four, five, six years old, they can dress like adults. They can have their little gloves, their little patent leather purse, they have a little suit on. Then you get to a certain age where you can't wear no hat. You gotta wait till you 15 or 16. In other words, why little children can model adults. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They can kind of, you know, and you see that among the icon. You see, in fact, there's a book. I, I got a lot of these different books. There's one here, Divine Kingship of Asante. The Asante people, this is the people without the gold in West Africa. This is just one out of many. I wish I could put my hands on. Um, Oh my goodness, a fool of Sutherland. There's a number of other books. I love this little children's book that she did because it's called Childhood in Africa. And you see like when the Asantehini with all the gold and stuff comes out, they have a little boy, a little boy who's dressed like him, dressed like the king. I mean, what, I mean, because as a little boy, I can wear the little gold and my little crown and stuff. But then you get older, no, you can't, no. Now you're in the apprentice stage. As a little child, we can seal you off from expectation that you, what we're doing is previewing where we expect you to be when you turn 28 or when you turn 21 or 18 or 35 or 45 or 55. So WAP is almost like these are kindergartners and first grade. Y'all playing and stuff you really don't know. And so it's just like, wait, 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 wait. wait. I know you've grown. I know all your parts work. And I know you think you understand, but see, if you spent a week with the Odu Ifa and Shango or Yemiya, you may still come, but you might add something and take us here instead of all the way now. We just like, yeah, some whores in this house. Which the reason you took that loop is because the guy's riding the blue note. You wasn't even, you know, so you right. So, but then Beyonce and Black is King, the feeling I got, okay, this is like, and again, I'm not belittling her. I'm not at all. I, in fact, I, I really appreciate what is clearly a journey of I want to know. I, she wants to know. You know what I'm saying? And that's the beauty of it. I mean, she's learning. It's clearly you see it folding in over and over. I see Pharrell and Jay-Z got this thing on entrepreneurs. They just dropped the thing. And I'm like, I'm glad. Because a few years ago when Pharrell's like, we the new black, the new black them. Okay, bro. I'm not going to beef with you because now I see maybe this is where you were going. I'm, I'm fine, you know. So, but Beyonce at this point, Black is King, I'm looking at this like, if this had been submitted to me as an undergraduate thesis, I would say, this is good work. All right, let me see your, let me see your footnotes. Let me see your bibliography. Okay, okay, how did you read this? How did you read this? Because what I see is, she, she opens it at the ocean, clearly ocean. She's opening it with ritual. So she's already displaced the notion of this binary, this gender binary that the West tried to impose on us. In other words, you know, if you are for women, you're against men. Where the hell did that come from? Oh, that's, that's, that's y'all with Zeus and Hera and Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn and Napoleon and Joe. Yeah, no, goodbye. Children, family, elders, all genders. I'm doing the water rituals. I'm, I'm thinking, now in my mind, I'm footnoting. I'm looking at the Europe. Then she get the Dogon cosmology. You got the big headdresses on. But if you don't have a roadmap, this no, is too busy. This is no. Because what you do know, what you sense, what you know intuitively and through your life practice is none of this is accidental. So where are you trying to take me? Wait, wait, wait. No, no hold on. Let me hold up. I'll come back to this when I can see this a little different. Because right now here, this is not, and guess what? That's not, not only in my mind anyway, is that not bad? That's the only reaction we can have. Because. So if you don't know where someone is leading you, don't. You willfully, don't go. Don't willfully don't go. go. Don't just go. go. No, well, but see, here's the interesting thing. Who trusts Beyonce? And it's crazy, right? I don't, have you ever, I've never met her, obviously. I've never been around. Oh, have you, okay, never, well, I mean, you, you'll meet her before I will. But, I, but, but, but the idea is, I don't know you. So what, who trusts her? You know, entertainers are elevated to this idea of trust in, a, in an imagined community that popular culture has convened. And Beyonce in this generation, to me, is moving in the direction in some way that Mary McCabe or uh, Nina Simone, in other words, 
you become an iconic figure in part because you've tapped into a thing that people already had, but the trust is built by you then using that initial trust to guide them into a space where they recognize themselves and it leads to power. So Survivor, you know, with Destiny's Child and all that, you know, okay, Survivor, yeah, that's where they were. You know, F these dudes, I'm a Survivor. I mean, can you pay my telephone bill? All right, now, okay, we all, okay, yeah. Now you got them. Now you come to Black is King and there's a, there's a scene in there and a song in there and a vignette video is, is called Brown Skin Girl. And here come Kelly Rowling. You know what I'm saying? Oh, that's her, that's her girl. All right, so you got to come here. Here comes Lupita Nyong'o. It's like, okay. And, but she starts with this montage of black women and there's a sister in there who's albino. So of course, we know, as we talked about before, albinism, she, she got blonde hair, blue eyes, her skin is whiter than any white person and she never left the continent of Africa because that's the genetic variation of Africa. We're the oldest people in the world. Tallest, shortest, whitest, darkest, everything is in Africa. You ain't got to go nowhere. When the white people come from, no, white people, that's a genetic variation due to migration. The genetic variation based on the genome in all of our bodies, that's exclusively African. Let's be clear. So she's, she's making a statement with all of them, and then she's bringing in people you know, putting them next to people you don't know, and then the song is talking about the beauty of sisterhood, the beauty of community. I said, okay, let's lift this one out of your senior thesis. I think Ground Skin Girl is one of the strongest. Let me, but let me go back to one of the earlier ones you did. This whole notion when you got, uh, 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 don't jealous me, you got Yemi, uh, Yemi Alade, Mr. Easy, you got these Nigerian cats, you got these Africans coming in here, and you got this guy in this white suit, and he, and he got a snake around him. That's gonna make the Christians, whoa. But see, I see that snake, I'm thinking Dambala. <laughs> I'm thinking Vodun, and I'm thinking, you thinking Vodun, and the snake is yellow. And then you come in, with just the, but then the song says, snake don't dance with no monkey. Snake don't dance with monkey. And I'm like, right, who is the monkey? The monkey is Eshu in my mind, Papa Legba, the guardian of the crossroads. I mean, you bringing in Vodun, but this is very, because now you're playing with a thing that if the Haitians see this, they're going to read this very, oh, are you a Rulzi? Is this Rada or Petro? In other words, Vodun got a hot side and a cool side. The cool side of Vodun is you're using that power for good. The hot side of Vodun, you're using it for what you want. And this is why, for example, okay, here's, an, here's another example from the flashes. Have you ever uh, heard or been taught or told, told more than taught, about when a man should and should not eat something prepared with red sauce? No. Like in the South, big thing is red sauce. Like you ask somebody from Louisiana or Texas, somebody, you know, red sauce is a sauce that can hide blood. So. If a woman wants you to fall in love with her and she give you some spaghetti or some got red sauce that you don't know that woman, you better trust who that is because she got the capacity to make you fall in love with her by, based on what she put in it. And red sauce makes it easier to disguise. Here's another one. First time, and I, I experienced this myself. You know, we, I think a lot, a lot of young boys have. And I say boys because we were boys. I mean, we teenagers, but we boys. You get on your bike in the summertime, you done got your grass cutting money, you done bought your comic books, whatever you're gonna buy. Then you ride your bike over your little girlfriend house. I love how Africans use Ebonics. It's all English, but if you don't speak Ebonics, you can't hear what they said. Uh-huh, you been with your little girlfriend. That word little is only deployed in, in other words, it's not your sister, it's not your mama, it's not your cousins. That's that girl we don't know. So we're gonna say little in front of it right quick. But if you don't speak Ebonics, you out here coming here, you go, I see you got your little girlfriend with you. In other words, you haven't yet been brought in. If you come in here, it's a hierarchy, right? So you go over your girlfriend's house, and we used to, you know, they braid our hair, then you blow it all out, then you braid it again, whatever. First time you come home with your hair braided and it wasn't your sister, or wasn't your cousin from Cross Street, who been, who been, who been in your hair? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Who been in your hair? It wasn't Francis, it wasn't Cassie, it was a, so who been in your hair? Are this your little girlfriend? Yeah, you need to bring her around. Why? Because hair comes off your body and the Congo people would say mm. if you have something off somebody's body hair fingernails which is why give me my hair when I leave the shop I need to burn it or burn my hair in front of me or it isn't just hygiene where you clip toenails and put on newspaper no I need to flush these down the toilet because if you get a piece of my organic material 
You can put that in a doll. You can put that in a packet. You can speak some over it. And this thing, no, I couldn't wake up or I couldn't leave your house. In other words, people say, oh, that's superstition. No, it's just another way of knowing. It's about relationships. And I say, I like to say that when you get to that Beyonce, black is king, snake don't dance, no monkey. And the Haitians are looking at that. They're like, yeah, you playing, you got the snake in there. You got the guy in the white suit in there. I'm looking at you like, but then there's an elder that comes in. Because the little boy, you know, she opens the thing with this little boy child. She closes the thing when she gets at the end, dedicating it to their son, Sir Carter. And she's got the little boy. The little boy goes all the way through the hour and 20 some minutes. Why? Because he's the figure that is vulnerable. He's going to be at the crossroads. Sometimes he's in red. Then you got the elder intervening. Here's the guy in white with the snake. Then Beyonce got the snake. The little boy looking. They got motorcycles around him. He's in danger. The elder comes in and stops. The, you got horns. People got horns in there. Wait, these horns, that's the devil. No, the cow is very important in many African traditions because the cow gives milk. The cow gives meat. The cow reproduces itself, which means you can eat. Cattle is at the center of many Africana ways of knowing. The Egyptians, in fact, when you see those horns, that is the symbol, among others, of Het Heru. Het Heru is what the Greeks call Hathor. They were so she's the cow goddess. No, uh uh. Het Heru. Het, one of the words for house, for enclosure, like a box. Heru is the son of a sar and a set. So he is the child who represents the kind of good tendency. He has to fight his uncle, Setek, or Set, who we might trace him, Satan, say evil Satan. No, yeah, Setek is the errant quality, the, the bad choice, what do we call evil? The battle of Horus and Set is a metaphor for that struggle within us, what the Muslims might call the jihad, the struggle for character to emerge. So that's the battle. But the son in that, the good representative, Heru, Het Heru, is the house of Heru. So when you see her name, you see this falcon, it's a symbol of a falcon, and then you see this enclosure around the falcon. So you, it, a Western would say, oh, so this is really about men. No, this guy ain't got nowhere to live. Do you understand Het Heru, the house of Heru? That's the woman. The woman is the house. <laughs> you understand? The woman is the place. So when you see those cow horns, what you're seeing is Het Heru, in other words, Beyonce said, I'm the mother, I'm the wife, but those words don't encompass what I am. I am the woman. Do you understand the universe? Do you understand the house in which you live? So you think it's about you. If I leave, you're done. While everything out here is coming on you, I am the house. In fact, there's nothing outside of me. I am the house of Heru. So I'm saying she's playing with these symbols. And I don't know whether she knows all this or not, but one thing is clear. When she showed that picture or that book, Black gods and kings, what that said to me is, whether you're using that as a prop or not, you at least know where to look. And I suspect she knows more than just where to look. So now I'm looking at her like, yeah, I'm giving Disney no money. They making money. Because what Disney recognizes is the world's majority non-white and the African culture drives so much of the world that Disney said, we're going to make all the money in the 21st and 22nd century. But I'm watching her. And when she ends it, let me, let me just go, when she ends it, it's very interesting when she gets to Black Parade, she has a, I mean, and there's a lot of other things in there. I mean, you know, you see the white casket going through and, and then there's, they pass them on the road. She's standing there in her colors and then there's a guy in kind of a bluish green. That's Wasir in the comedic. I'm not saying she made him Wasir, but I'm looking at it because of that knowledge base. And I'm saying that's Wasir. And I said, there's a white casket that goes by, which lets me know if that's what you're doing. See, the idea of Wasir is in a casket, his brother kills him. Satek kills Wasir. But Wasir is now sent across that water. He's the Lord of the Westerners. In other words, he's the one who is in charge of everyone who has died. So in the Congo thing, he will be the one underneath the line. But his brother sent him there by killing him. So when the son Heru comes, Heru has to avenge his father's death, but he can't kill his uncle because his uncle, even though his uncle has behaved quote unquote evilly, his brother, his, he's still his uncle. So you got to subdue that, but you can't get rid of it. It's always going to be there. So when that casket goes by and black is king, I'm looking like, wow, is she really talking about the death and resurrection of Wasir? Because the guy, I'm sorry, the color of Wasir, when he goes across, is like a bluish green. So in other words, I'm looking like, 
the cats get past the guy with bluish green. I'm like, and then they get into this whole water thing. She comes out of the water like she's Oshun. She's got a thing on her head that looks like the comedic symbol for gold, Nebu. Nebu, the name uh, that means like gold, is all, that's the root of the word Nubia. You know, Nubia is where the gold comes from. That's upper Africa. That's where you Sudan and stuff. So I'm looking at her like, but if you look at the scene in the, in the movie, in Black is King, critics, if they say anything at all, are going to get caught up, if they get caught up at all, with the Disney reference. Because she's swimming like in a synchronized and they all fall off into the water. Like that Esther Williams stuff from MGM and all that. They're going to catch that. But if you don't catch the other symbolism, you realize, no, she's exploding that from the inside. And they're talking, then Kendrick comes along with this song, Water. You know, one day I took a, a swim in the Nile. I'm like, wait. Oh, this is interesting because what the Greeks did when they remixed that Osun, that the story of what Asara and As and Set, they said, now this isn't Egyptian. But what the Greeks added to it, it was Plutarch, I think, said this. And then it messed it up because now people still quote it as if it's the Egyptian, but it's not, it's the Greek. Plutarch is like when Set killed his brother, he then chopped him up and he threw all the pieces everywhere where he couldn't find anything except the penis. He took his penis and threw it in the Nile and it was swallowed by a catfish. So no, that's why we don't eat catfish. It's like a totem thing. But the Greeks are putting this thing out. But this is where it's interesting. Then he said, then the Greeks remix it and say, then his wife, uh, Asar, I'm sorry, his wife, Aset, who Greeks call uh, Isis, and her sister, who was his wife, Nebet, or Nephthys, them two of them got together and reassembled the husband. But the one thing they couldn't find was the penis because it had been swallowed up. So they made a penis. And then she, then, then the bob bird, the bird came and hovered over what's uh, what's a sar, and then came to her and put a baby inside of um a, 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 um um Isis and she gave birth. That's Heru. It's an immaculate conception. So I mean that that's the original story of All you right. know so the Jesus story riffs on that. <laughs> yeah, no. All right, so we're gonna go live next week. If y'all got questions, ask them. Mm -hmm. Be ready. Be ready to ask questions. We'll build questions. We're gonna talk about religion and God. So if you have questions as it relates to what we both know, you know, because we don't know everything, and please contribute. Also, um, subscribe to this. No. Subscribe, subscribe, and follow Dr. Carr on Twitter at Africana Carr. Yeah. Africana Carr. You can follow me too at Karen Hunter. That's yes. So but I'm grateful that we're starting Please. this because this is a journey <laughs> towards freedom. And before I let you go, because you know the, the time is what it is. What's on your shirt? Who is this Delaney person? Oh. Oh yeah, you? this is uh, Martin Delaney. Yes. Let me get up out of my little chair. Martin Delaney was the highest ranking black field officer in the Civil War. There was another brother named Augusta who was a major as well, but he was a surgeon at Freeman's Hospital, which is now Howard Hospital. Martin Delaney, here he is with his military stuff on, on both sides. Here he is in the middle from Charlestown, West Virginia, born into enslavement. They were born, his, his mother had to get them out of Charlestown because she taught the kids how to read. Catherine moved to Pennsylvania, uh, was going to medical school, went to Harvard Medical School until the white students at Harvard went to the dean and said, look, either Delaney leaves or we leave. And so they put him out of Harvard Medical School, comes back to Pittsburgh, apprentices with a doctor, then hooks up with Frederick Douglass, his man. He becomes, he, Delaney starts a newspaper. This is like the 1840s called the Pittsburgh Mystery. He's right, and then him and Douglass join together and he becomes a correspondent with Douglass for the North Star, Frederick Douglass' newspaper. Then uh, Delaney, ends up, now Delaney, his whole life is like, black is best. I'm black, my people black, it's not a joke. So he ends up going to what we now call Nigeria. He's there with another brother who left a couple days before him, Robert Campbell, who is from um, Jamaica. Robert Campbell, Martin Delaney, go to Nigeria. This is like 1857, 58. Because around the same time, Delaney is mad because Harriet Beecher Stowden wrote a book called Uncle Tom's Cabin. And he's furious because Delaney said, you ripped off Josiah Henson, who's now in Canada, had to leave, and you ain't giving him no check. He gets mad at, at Frederick Douglass. Hey, man, Linda, why don't you tell Linda, me? Linda, Brent, uh, Linda Brent, I think she stole, she straight jacked that story from somebody. She, from a, Yes. 
Go ahead. Harry, beat, Harry beat your stove, pulling an M&M, you know, Elvis yeah. kind of thing. You know what I'm saying? Got rich. I mean, and she didn't want slavery. She's an abolitionist, but let's be clear. You ain't never hook up Josiah Henson, Delaney Spears. So Delaney's like, you know what? After this, I'm like, Delaney writes a serial novel in a black newspaper called The Anglo-African. The name of the novel he writes is, to my mind, and we don't have to do this, but if you had to pick one book from the 19th century, so you got to read this book. I would say it ain't the narrative of Freddie Douglas. It's not you. It's Blake. That's the name of Martin Delaney's book, his novel, which is kind of like a historical. He's got footnotes and stuff in it. It's called Blake or the Huts of America. It's this whole wild story of uh, this, in, this African who escapes enslavement, comes back, gets his parents, gets them out, comes back. He's looking for his wife because they've been separated. He go, he gets a boat back to Africa. He goes to the Caribbean. He's plotting an international slave rebellion. He's writing this in the 1850s. He said, cabins, man, oh, damn, you know what? Forget it, Blake or the huts of America. And he, he's meeting with Native Americans in the swamp in North Carolina. I mean, it's, it's like, this is a book. Wait, well, this is like Black Panther. No, this is the 1850s. Martin Delaney, and then he goes to Africa and tells the what we now know as the Nigerians, a uh, place called Abiokuta, the Alake, the guy that's kind of, we would say the king. He said, look, man, we can corner the international cotton market. The Africans who were enslaved in Africa, that's, I mean, and that's, that's all we've been doing. If we come here, we grow cotton, we put everybody out of business. They sign a treaty saying we're going to bring, but then the Civil War jumps off. Delaney says, hold on, I'll be back. Comes back to the United States, tells Abraham Lincoln, look here, man, this is how you win the war. We need black troops and black officers. Lincoln is so shook and impressed with Delaney. He said, you know what? This might work. You're a major. He becomes the first major. <laughs> and it's a, Delaney is recruiting black soldiers to fight in the Civil War. See, people say, oh, we ain't no Africans. Hey, everybody, everybody calm down. This is not mutually exclusive. You can be both in. He came back. Do you understand? Delaney was out. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He, he's in the International Explorers. He, he's in England. He, he scares the United States government. He leaves Africa, goes to uh, England. And who's there? Representatives of the United States government. James Buchanan is the president. They come back to the United States and say, who the hell is this Martin Delaney guy, man? We should have his ass in chains. He, he in England talking about it. And, and, and so the United States government is like, but when Lincoln gets in, Delaney throws in for the Civil War. He survives. He didn't go to see combat. John Brown wanted Delaney to join him, just like he wanted Harriet Tubman to know. Delaney was friends with Mary Ann Shad Carey. She left. She was in Canada. This, and we talked about Josiah Henson. We talked about Henry Bibb. All these guys, Delaney is one of those guys with them. Should we leave? Should we stay? If we stay, how are we going to fight? If we fight, do we want to just get our own state? I mean, this is the genius. People talk about the, look, I, no shade on anything going on in 2020. But if you want to stand black, the black American, go to the 19th century in that decade before and after the Civil War. That's really when you see us trying, look, we free. No, hell no. Anybody ask me whether I wanted to stay? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So Delaney, I mean, all this kind of thing. So anyway, look, to end it, Delaney ends up in South Carolina. He runs afoul of some blacks in South Carolina because he's saying, I don't know about these Republicans, you know, he's in the reconstruction government so, you know, so he's, he's got politics that don't necessarily align. He's a Prince Hall Mason. He's trying to get them galvanized. Then he said, I'm gonna study some other stuff. He started studying Egyptian hieroglyphs. The last book he writes, 1879, before he passed away is called The Origins of Race and Color. He's gonna come up with a theory of global black identity. And he's gonna start with the glyphs. So you see him in there trying to translate hieroglyphs. And he's got this whole scheme in his mind worked out. By now he's in Ohio. He and his wife and their children living Wilberforce, Ohio. And so uh, there's a fire that wipes out a lot of his stuff at Wilberforce. It's really sad. Daniel Alexander Payne, I think, is president of Wilberforce at the time. Delaney passed away, his wife passed away. Martin Delaney, his wife is Catherine, actually, Catherine Delaney. They are buried just outside of Wilberforce, Ohio, in a cemetery. And every two years, we would have gone, this was our year for going. We were there two years ago. Every two years, my dear friend Larry Crow, L. Franklin Crow, Larry Crow, who is one of the interviewers for History Makers. Anybody knows the, the History Makers website? If you go to History Makers, the voice you'll hear interviewing most of those people is Larry Crow. He's one of the most brilliant historians in the world, living or dead. Larry Crow, you talk about, man, Larry Crow's a master. Crow put together, along with Africans out of Chicago, tying back to something we talked about before, Jacob Carruthers. 
because Carru- Delaney was Carruthers' hero. All his guys, he studied those hieroglyphs in the 19th century. Anderson Thompson, Ife Carruthers, Conrad Ware. Out of Chicago, they would go to Martin Delaney's grave. They used to go every year. I, I went for my first time, I was 20 years ago, I went with them. Now they go every other year. And Larry puts it together because he's out of Dayton. Paul Lawrence Dunbar, Hunter Dunbar. We go to the grave site. Delaney's buried there. Catherine's buried there. And several of their children. This is the 19th century when these children are born. So we're talking about the 1840s, 1850s, 1860s. These children, they named all of their children after black heroes. Toussaint Louverture, Cleopatra, Ramses. <laughs> they named all their children. He said, oh, y'all, hotel, hey, everybody be quiet. Don't open your mouth, put your brain on display, because what you're going to find out is if you go back to that same Civil War, we know Frederick Douglass, we know Sojourner Truth, we know Harriet Tubman, and we should, but Martin Robeson Delaney. And this is one of the shirts, this is from the trip we made in 2014. Okay. So Martin Delaney, yeah, we, every, every year we get a shirt. So next year we'll go, you got to come, Karen, you can broadcast from there. We- <laughs> you, got, you, got, you got me uh, open to so many things I never thought that I needed to know. And Martin Delaney, oh. I- I'm I'm going down a Blake rabbit hole. Thank you. You you you're gonna love thank Delaney. You. Thank you. Thank you, you and Delaney cut out the same cloth, Karen. I promise you. <laughs> oh my goodness! I love you so much. I um, love you. Too. I'm looking forward oh. to next week going live. Uh, again, breadcrumbs. These are breadcrumbs. Pick them up. Feed yourself. Make some more bread. Let's go. Dr. Yes. Carr, listen. I know school is starting back up for both of us, which is Lord, uh, we're God. here. God so, bless you, sis. No, pray for us that we can pray continue. for us. Yeah, because this is this a lot. It's a lot. But um, it's a lot. And you saw what our man did. You I just saw it. Uh, uh, you saw what our man uh, Michael Harriet at the root said. No, what what did he say? I know he. Said, I, just, I saw it on Twitter. Harriet said. Mike said, uh, "In class with Car Karen Hunter is the most binge worthy thing to watch on the whole GD internet." <laughs> He just I, said, I, I, about that, bro. I love him so much. He's homeschooled. You know, you know, he's a homeschooled brother. One of the most yep. brilliant. We, at some point, we're gonna have we're gonna have to invite him into this because we should have we should he, have a mic. He's a thinker. Yes. All right. Yes, well, thank, he you. Is. thank you, Mr. Harriet. I I didn't see that. Yes. But yeah. This is is uh, this is a work uh, of of divinity right here. This is all the Indeed. answers. Ain't got nothing to do with us. Divine Indeed. problem. Indeed. Uh, Indeed. In the name of Jesus, the internet held up. Thank you. <laughs> and we'll see right. you next. We be ready with your questions live. Thank you, Dr. Carr. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Hunter. See you soon.